Welcome back to Madman Review. This is your host, Mike. In this video, we're diving into a topic that's been buzzing in the two-way communities for a while. The Cargill v. Garland case, also known as the Bumpstock case. Now, if you've been following the ins and outs of gun legislation and court battles, you know we've seen some pretty significant cases over the years. But let me tell you, Cargill v. Garland is gearing up to be a real game changer, potentially even more impactful than the landmark Bruin decision. Why, you ask? Well, it's not just about gun rights per se. It's about the very fabric of how laws are made and enforced in this godforsaken country. If you know how much of an impact the Bruin decision has, then you probably know why it's such a big deal. If you don't, then... Let's do a recap. What the hell is Bruin? I'm pretty sure some of you are asking this question right now. Don't worry, I got your back. So, for decades, the debate around gun control and Second Amendment rights has been hotter than a July barbecue. Some states have been playing tug-of-war with gun laws, trying to find that sweet spot between keeping us safe respecting our rights to keep and bear arms. Others don't care one bit. A prime example, New York. A communist state with draconian gun laws. When it came to people carrying a concealed weapon around town, New York had this law that said if you wanted to carry a concealed handgun, you had to show, quote-unquote, proper cause. Like, what the hell, right? To most folks who have never held a gun since birth, it sounded reasonable at first glance, but the catch was in the details. Proper cause wasn't just about saying you wanted the gun for self-defense. Nope, you had to prove that there's a special need for protection that went above and beyond what the average Joe or Jane might have. It was impossible to show proper cause. So, who stepped up to challenge this? The New York State Rifle and Pistol Association backed by two guys who were told they didn't meet the mark for proper cause. They weren't looking to cause trouble. They just wanted the right to carry their guns under the Second Amendment. They took their case all the way to the top, asking the Supreme Court to answer a big question. Did New York's law trample on folks' Second Amendment rights by making it too hard to get a license to carry a concealed handgun? This wasn't just about a couple of gun enthusiasts in New York. It was a question that echoed other so-called progressive state across the country. The Supreme Court's answer would have the power to shake up gun laws far beyond communist New York, setting a precedent that could affect millions. So, when the justices sat down to weigh in on Bruin, they weren't just deciding a local issue. They were about to drop a decision that would ripple through the nation's ongoing conversation about guns, rights, and safety. The Effects of Bruin The Bruin decision changed the game, especially for states that had a tight grip on gun control laws. States that had laws similar to New York's, the ones making you jump through hoops <laughs> to carry concealed, found themselves in a pickle. They had to go back to the drawing board because the Supreme Court essentially said, Hey, your retarded rules are deleted. The ripple effect of Bruin is massive. It has got folks wondering, What's next? Are we going to see challenges to other gun laws? Like bans on certain types of firearms or limits on magazine sizes? You bet. Reactions to Bruin have been all over the map. On one side, two-way advocates like yours truly are popping champagne. Thrilled that the Supreme Court backed a more straightforward interpretation of the Second Amendment. We all see it as a victory lap for personal freedom and self-defense rights. On the flip side, gun control idiots and knee-jerk fuds are hitting the alarm. Horrified by the fact that this decision would make it tougher to pass laws that prevent gun violence. They are making it sound like they are only concerned about gun control for the safety of communities, when in reality... All they're really concerned about is control. Big deal. Now what? So, Bruin's a major player in the gun rights scene, completely reshaping how we look at gun laws in America. 
It's like setting a new standard, giving us pro two-way people a powerful tool in our toolbox. This decision is going to show up in courtrooms across the country, challenging the old and new gun control measures alike. And it's not just about the legal battles. Bruins also assemble in the bigger conversation about finding that sweet spot between keeping people safe and respecting personal freedoms. It truly is a landmark decision. But how is the bump stock case any bigger? Let's now talk about Cargill v. Garland. If you're not familiar, bump stocks are these attachments that let a semi-auto firearm shoot rapid fire, kind of mimicking an automatic weapon, for better or worse. The slide fire group that makes the most popular form of bump stocks, they're sold out of them. The secondary market, prices for bump stocks are going through the roof because people are worried they're going to be banned by the ATF or perhaps legislation in Congress for which there is some support. Is it ever possible in your experience with the ATF to take things away? It seems as though you can regulate them being sold in the future, but taking them away is a much tougher thing. Remember the tragedy in Las Vegas back in 2017? That horrific event brought bump stocks into the national spotlight big time. Before you knew it, everyone from your next door neighbor to lawmakers was talking about them. Now, traditionally, if the government wanted to ban something like bump stocks, you'd expect a bit of back and forth in Congress, maybe some heated debates, and potentially new legislation getting passed, right? But here's the curveball. Donald Trump, who claims to be pro 2 way took a shortcut. Instead of waiting for Congress to hash it out, he leaned on the ATF to just redefine the rules, making bump stocks a no-go under existing laws. This move was kind of groundbreaking, and not in a good way. It opened up this whole new playbook for handling gun control without bordering to get new laws on the books. Just like that, the ATF wielded overwhelming power, tasked with enforcing it whatever changes they want and turning regular folks who owned bum stocks into overnight outlaws. No warning, no legislative debate, just a sudden shift in policy. This approach set a precedent, making folks wonder what could be next on the chopping block with just a stroke of the pen. And before we all knew it, the ATF penned a new rule on pistol braces in January 2023, which we won't cover in this video because it's too darn broad. Let me know if you want an update on that stupid rule. But back to the topic. So, who's Cargill? Michael Cargill, who owns Central Texas Gunworks and is a gun enthusiast himself, wasn't too happy about a new rule from the ATF saying bump stocks were now illegal. He had brought a couple of these bump stocks before the rule was even a thing and gave them up once the rule kicked in. Not stopping there, he decided to take things to court arguing that the ATF was stepping out of line by making this call without Congress saying it was okay. And so when the administration, the Trump administration, decided to ban them through the ATF, I thought that that was actually crazy because my thoughts were, if you allow an agency to ban this particular product, you give them this power to do this, what what stops them later on down the road when there is a Democrat president in office and coming after other different parts and pieces of rifles? And so I said, we need to do something about this. So I, I reached out to the NRA. I reached out to different organizations and different people. And everyone was on the same same tune saying, it's OK. We'll go ahead and give up the bump stocks. We don't care about those. I said, are you guys listening to yourself? You can't just give this up because if we give this up. You give them an inch. They're going to take a mile. And I really didn't care about bump stocks, but I care about other different parts and pieces and accessories and things of that nature. And I say, we cannot give this much power to the ATF. One thing is ATF and other agencies cannot create a right law. That power is reserved for Congress. You know, the people that we send to DC to represent us, the people. This whole situation has been bouncing around in the courts and it landed in the Fifth Circuit. This is a big deal because the Fifth Circuit essentially nullified this stupid legal doctrine the feds have been weaponizing called Chevron deference. It's what gives the ATF the power to interpret laws that are kind of vague and write rules that can be implemented without approval from Congress. This case goes beyond bum stocks. Now that the Supreme Court has decided they'll take a look, it's kind of a big moment. 
They're going to dig into whether agencies like the ATF have too much power to interpret laws on their own, how that power should be used, maybe even how to apply certain rules when laws aren't clear. Whatever the Supreme Court decides could really shake up how the ATF does its thing and impact gun control laws in a big way across the country. This case is a big deal because it's challenging the whole setup of how executive agencies like the ATF flex their muscle in shaping laws. Usually, Congress makes the laws and agencies enforce them, but sometimes these agencies get a wee bit too creative. Essentially, Cargill v. Garland can nullify Chevron deference, which means all federal agencies, not just the ATF, may end up getting neutered. Huh. Now, if we slide Bruin next to Cargill, we get an interesting picture of judicial decisions shaping our world. While Bruin redefined how we look at gun rights under the Second Amendment, Cargill will shake up the entire landscape of regulatory power. Both cases are about drawing lines in the sand, but while Bruin focused on constitutional rights, Cargill zooms out, tackling the broader question of how those rights are regulated and who get to call the shots. If Cargill swings in a way that clips the ATF's wings, it could set a precedent that impacts how all executive agencies operate. It's like a domino effect. Change one piece, and everything else might shift too. So, while the media might get caught up in the drama of bump stocks, the real story is much bigger. Cargill v. Garland has the potential to redefine the boundaries of regulatory authority, impacting not just gun laws, but how all sorts of laws are enforced across the board. And comparing it to Bruin, it shows how the courts can be the arena where the fundamental questions about our rights and how they're protected are wrestled over. This case is about more than just the specifics. It's about the big picture of power, regulation, and rights in America. How it affects you and me. At its core, this case throws a spotlight on the whole separation of powers gig we've got going in our government system. The big question on everyone's mind is, who gets the final say? Is it Congress, the folks we elect to make laws, or the agencies appointed to enforce them? Now, drag the Second Amendment into this mix. A ruling in Cargill v. Garland could seriously shake up how we interpret gun rights going forward. If the Supreme Court decides the ATF went too far, it will tighten the leash on how they influence gun laws without stepping on Congress's toes. This case has the potential to etch new guidelines into the bedrock of how laws are applied, especially those touching on the Second Amendment. It's like drawing a new map that future lawmakers and enforcers have to navigate. Depending on how the Supreme Court rules, we can see a shift in the balance of power that tilts back towards a more literal interpretation of laws as written by Congress. Jumping into potential outcomes and their impact, imagine if the Supreme Court sides with Cargill. This could mean a tighter rein on agencies, making them think twice before stretching laws to fit their agenda. It could lead to a scenario where future gun legislation and regulations have to clear a higher bar, sticking closer to the text Congress pens down. This doesn't just reshape gun laws. It could redefine regulatory practices across the board, making sure that when agencies step up to the plate, they're swinging within the lines drawn by our elected officials. On the flip side, if the court backs the ATF, we're looking at a green light for agencies to keep interpreting laws with a bit more freedom. This could streamline how quickly regulations adapt to changing times, but raises questions about accountability and the balance of power. Final Thoughts Public engagement on Cargill v. Garland has been intense, especially among gun owners and legal eagles. We're all watching closely, keen on how this will affect our two-way rights. Wrapping it all up, Cargill v. Garland is going to be big. It shows the potential to deeply influence the American legal landscape, especially around gun laws and regulations. This case touches on big issues, separation of powers, the communist doctrine known as Chevron deference, and how we interpret constitutional rights. So, what can you do? Stay tuned to Cargill v. Garland. 
The hearing is scheduled on February 28th at 9 a.m. Eastern. Dive into the discussions, share your thoughts in the comments, and let's keep the conversation going. And please do us a solid by clicking on the like, share, and subscribe buttons. Thanks for watching, and God bless America.